Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the school board special meeting video conference, 7.30 a.m. on Friday, October 30th. Uh, pursuant to Minnesota statute section 13D.021 in the current state of emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this special session of the Independent School District 279 School Board will be conducted via electronic means. Superintendent Corey McIntyre and Board Chair Michael Ostafi have determined that due to the health pandemic and emergency declaration, a meeting format allowing for in-person attendance by the school board and the superintendent is not practical or prudent for the special session. Members of the public up to 10 are able to attend this virtual meeting in person at the Educational Service Center under CDC and MDH guidelines. Uh, members of the public may also monitor the meeting electronically streaming uh, and archive copy of the video recording will be available from the district website. Uh, so I'm going to uh, call this meeting to order. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I would like to do a roll call. Uh, Sherry, could you do the roll call? Director Bristol. Here. Director Dawson Walton. Here. Director Heather Douglas. Here. Director Mosqueda Jones. Here. Director Simons. Here. Superintendent McIntyre. Here. Director Ostafi. Here. Okay, with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Superintendent McIntyre to discuss the uh, 279 Ready to Restart Osseo Area School Learning Model recommendations. Superintendent right, thank McIntyre. You. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ostafi, and good morning, board members, and thanks once again for meeting at this early hour. I do want to start by thanking you once again for your hard work on all of our 279 Ready to Restart opening learning models work, our key readiness indicators, our dashboards, and everything that has been a part of our start of the school year. I appreciate the support you've shown through your actions with the opening of the school year in distance learning and all the way up to our current model of K-12 hybrid, ensuring that all the safety components of the Minnesota safe learning plan have been able to be implemented here in Osseo Area Schools. This morning, I'm bringing a new recommendation in response to the changing conditions we're seeing. I'm asking the board to approve my recommendation to move to the model of hybrid learning for elementary and distance learning for secondary on Monday, November 9th, including providing targeted supports at the secondary level for some of our students receiving intensive services in special education, English learner services, and clinical mental health services. I'm also recommending we continue athletics and activities as long as they can be done safely while in distance learning at the secondary level. So next I'll briefly present the updated information that's the basis for this recommendation. So just give me a second here. Okay, can I just have someone give me a verbal that you can see the slides, okay? Yeah, we're good. Thank you. Okay, our current readiness dashboards reflect our 10 key readiness indicators for each learning model. And one of those readiness indicators that inform our decisions to change learning models is meeting our state requirements based on county case rates, consultation with MDE, MDH, and Hennepin County Public Health, which I'll update you on in just a moment. Our ISD 279 Safe Learning Plan levels is our version of the Minnesota Safe Learning Plan, and it currently reflects the district in level three with our uh, current model of K-12 hybrid which we started on September 28th. In order to make decisions for changing our learning models, we've been following our five-step process, which includes continuously reviewing our uh, new county and city case rate data, district COVID statistics, our key readiness indicators, and completing the required consultation with Minnesota Department of Education, Minnesota Department of Health, and the regional support team in Hennepin County Public Health, along with additional input from district and school leaders, union leadership, and feedback we receive from staff, families, and students. We take this information and the district administration de designs and develops the recommendation and we bring that recommendation to the board for any district-wide decisions. And then lastly, we communicate and update stakeholders on the status of our learning models. This slide represents the state parameters for the county case rate uh, counts and learning models for school districts that was uh, used in as a starting point. Please note that the learning model for county case rate data between 30 and 49 is hybrid learning for elementary students and distance learning for secondary students. New guidance from MDE this past week 
is that school districts need to take into account not only this county level data when determining learning models, but also city level data, number of confirmed cases, quarantines and close contacts in our school community, in each of our school buildings in our district and other data such as individuals with influenza-like illness. And providing you with the most up-to-date case rate data from Hennepin County through October 19th, the Hennepin County case rate has increased 3.3 points, putting the county number at 29. This graph provides you with the updated local city data and Brooklyn Center saw an increase of 12.6 points and is now at 53.4. Brooklyn Park saw an increase of 8.5 and is now at 48.9. Maple Grove saw an increase of 1.7 and is now at 30.3. Lastly, Plymouth saw an increase of five points and is now at 26.5. Out of the 18 cities with 10,000 or more residents included in the Hennepin County data, we again have the top two or highest two cities in the county with Brooklyn Center and Brooklyn Park. When looking at our COVID-19 statistics since August 20th, which is our school year to date totals, we've had 124 positive cases so far between staff and students. And this has gradually been increasing weekly with 25 this past week. When looking at our symptomatic Cases reported, we've had year to date since August 20th, 599 cases this year, gradually increasing each week with 116 symptomatic cases this past week. And when looking at our close contact cases reported, we've had uh, year to date 768 cases this year with 201 of those close contact cases in this past week. So in summary, when you add our positive cases, symptomatic cases and close contacts, we've had nearly, um, 1,500 total with 325 of those in the last week, which um, all, you know, basically result in quarantine for those involved. And uh, this really has had an impact on our ability to continue to staff and operate our schools effectively. For example, we're now experiencing a teacher absentee rate of about two and a half times the normal uh, absentee rate we see. We also have regularly been in consultation as required with the M, uh, MDE and MDH regional support team in Hennepin County Public Health. This week, the Hennepin County uh, supervising epidemiologist was very concerned, uh, actually we're shocked and very concerned about the amount that the rates have increased since last week. Uh, we saw a large jump last week as well. The significant concern for all three cities being over that threshold of 30, and the seriously concerned about our cities that are near or over 50. The cities in our district are continuing to experience an accelerated spread and rapid upward trend with a positivity rate that's concerning. Hennepin County had their highest single day total on Wednesday with 530 cases. And the expectation is case rates will continue to climb for the weeks to come. Increased case rates in Hennepin County and our cities in our district are reflective of community spread and are not due to specific reasons such as um, an assisted living facility outbreak, manufacturing facility or correctional facility outbreak. When they, with the expectation that case rates will continue to increase for weeks to come, they supported the move to distance learning for secondary and staying in the elementary hybrid, all the while continuing to monitor this quickly changing situation very closely. Two things to note, first, a, a number of districts in the Metro have decided or are planning to move to distance learning the first two weeks here in November. And secondly, we did have conversation about moving schools to distance learning um, in the cities where the highest case rates exist, but we do have all three cities over that threshold of 30 uh, regarding the state model of distance learning for secondary schools. And it's also important to remember that with our inter-district transfer and open enrollment process, we have students attending different schools than their, where they live or, or their boundary school across the district. I know this is hard to, to read, um, but I just wanted to give, give you the visual here. We did create an updated key readiness uh, dashboard for this model of elementary hybrid and secondary distance learning for the Minnesota State Learning Plan. And again, I know it's hard to read, but it reflects nine out of the 10 key readiness indicators in this model are all in the green zone or our, our level three, our highest level, indicating we're ready to transition to, the, to this model. The one uh, indicator in the yellow is our child care indicator where we're continuing to um, work on ensuring child care is fully staffed. And then lastly here, my recommendation is to continue with activities and athletics while in distance learning at the secondary level for as long as we are able. We will have to discontinue if there is an outbreak, a substantial uncontrolled spread, uh, a significant degree of impact or multiple confirmed cases or a large scale outbreak, or if 
the um, Minnesota Department of Better uh, Health Department directs us to, to stop. Our COVID-19 uh, safety plan for activities and athletics is based on those requirements by MDE and MDH in the high school league. And right now it's in place and it's working. So my recommendation is to continue for the time being. All right, so, so just some additional comments here um, as we wrap up. Since early August, we have communicated that we can expect movement amongst the learning models throughout the year based on the evolving virus activity. And we are experiencing an accelerated rate of positive cases in our communities and in our district numbers. As a community, we need to collectively stay committed to the primary health precautions of wearing masks, social distancing, and avoiding large groups. Without the ability to do that well, we will see even higher positive cases and high numbers of student and staff quarantine occurrences in our building that will jeopardize our ability to keep our schools open at the elementary level. So in closing, as I said before, it needs to be said again, please know I don't take this decision lightly. I know it's affecting the lives in our district and everyone it touches. For some, it means stress. For others, it brings relief. We have heard from parents who strongly oppose this decision and from parents who strongly support it. And I understand there is no easy answer here and there's no way to please everyone with any learning model decision. We will continue to base our decisions as best we can on state direction and guidance and our local, county, city, and district data. As said before, and I wanna say again, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, change has been the only constant it seems and it continues to test our collective spirit. I, I sincerely appreciate the patience and understanding of all of our stakeholders as we navigate these challenging times. And please know my goal continues to be with this recommendation, the ability to ensure that we provide our scholars with the best educational experience possible while doing it as safely as possible. So Chair, I'll stop you with that. My recommendation is to move to hybrid learning at, for, for elementary and distance learning for secondary starting on Monday, November 9th with athletics and activities continuing on. Thank you. All right, thank you, Superintendent McIntyre, and I think you mean to stay in hybrid for elementary and move to uh, distance in secondary. Correct, thanks uh, for clarifying. Uh, no problem. Uh, so, uh, board members, uh, I, I guess we can just move to a motion and then go into discussion and any questions for uh, Superintendent McIntyre. Uh, is there a motion to uh, move our secondary uh, learning model from hybrid uh, to uh, distance learning? So moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, now let's go to discussion. Uh, let's start with uh, just the way we're on my screen. Uh, let's start with uh, Director Douglas. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Corey, for um, a really succinct and informational update on where we stand and why we're being recommended this move. I know that it's going to be really hard for a lot of our families, but I also believe that it's the right decision given the circumstances. And I also really appreciate the um, specific commentary on sports because I know that's a really big concern for our families um, and I was just wondering if you could just share again for some of our families what distance plus is for students that need that thank you director Douglas yeah so we will be finalizing that by early next week but our intention is to provide um, support safely, safely supports for in-person learning for, the, for our students that have been, um, maybe have our most significant disabilities or most significant language needs along with the most significant kind of mental health uh, challenges that have been receiving clinical mental health services. So our case managers and other staff will be reaching out individually to their families and students to um, find out if they're comfortable or willing to do that and begin to schedule what that might look like on a case by case basis per their individual plans. Thank you. Uh, Director Dawson Walton. Um, 
yeah, Corey, I, I would um, echo, I just, I thank you for your diligence in, um, you know, this has definitely consumed you and, you know, it's so important. We've heard, you know, I look at, you know, in our role in education and I mean, we do, you know, our number one is to educate and um, to ensure safety for our students and staff. So um, I really um, do believe that, you know, those two, even though those two um, foundational aspects of, of our system are also what we're hearing from our community. And I think I, I really want to let our community know too, we, we, we hear you, um, the emails, the, the texts that come in, the um, even on social media, um, it's a pretty complex situation in terms of, um, you know, just the the various label, la excuse me, layers and levels um, of that goes into this decision above and beyond um, our school board. But, um, you know, I guess my question to Corey would be, um, knowing that or the indication from what you've received from MDE, MDH, and Hennepin County shows that numbers will continue to rise. Um, and so, um, is there like a glimmer of, let's say, um, I'm not going to say hope, but like, is there, what, what's kind of the trajectory, I guess I'd say from now until, you know, we're in this mode um, of your recommendation and then we know we're entering these winter months, but then is there a trajectory of um, even lessening um, and going even reverse to even hybrid in our air, in our schools? Yeah, thank you, Director Dawson Walton. And that is our hope. I like that word hope. And that's our intention is to try to get students uh, back in schools safely as possible, as soon as possible. The best I can give you based on the health experts is really right now, they're pretty confident about the next four to six weeks is their best prediction about, you know, this upward trend in the cases. So, you know, that puts us well into the winter months, but maybe possibly by winter or even early spring. And my hope is we see that starting to turn. I think it really depends on the behavior of all of us out in the community and, and doing all the things we can to mitigate. The better we all do together, the sooner school, you know, we can have students back in full time safely. So that's the best guidance I've been given at this point. Uh, hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Director Mosqueda Jones. Um, I wanna say thank you so much for um, the diligence of speaking to professionals um, and experts in this area. Um, <clears throat> I also wanna say, I appreciate, um, I've been hearing a lot from um, parents with kids with special needs. And so I appreciate you addressing that um, today and to let uh, families know that um, if that applies to you to please continue to talk to your case manager because speaking on any one individual um, experience is um, is difficult, and so you need to your case manager can help with that. Um, another thing I'm wondering is, is there ever a way that we will um, separate our very youngest learners, pre-K, K, first, second, something like that, um, as the numbers increase and what seems you know appropriate for um, differing learning styles just because I, in my experience, it's much more difficult for our youngest learners to be doing distance learning. Thank you, Director Mosqueda Jones. We continue to evaluate that as we look at those readiness indicators and we have, you know, and continue to explore that possibility. So as we move forward, I know that we're going to you know, look at everything from operations to staffing and those other things around does that model, um, look like a viable one for us as we continue to you know, move into the future, depending on the activity of, of the virus and, and its impact on us. So thank you for asking about that. For sure, and my priority is to make sure that um, we are keeping everyone as healthy as possible, um, physically and um, um, emotionally. And so um, I just wanna reiterate that it's difficult for, for all of us to be moving in and out of models. And um, if we can have any kind of stability for a little while, I know that's difficult with virus activities and everyone wants to get back into the classroom as soon as we possibly can in a safe manner um, to really be able to, for the 
sake of the mental health of our teachers and our students to be able to concentrate on, you know, one kind of way of teaching. And I know um, that's just a statement I made, but um, thank you. I really appreciate it. Chair Ostafi. Yes. I just I I just wanted to say that there's there seems to be an audio issue for people and so um I guess it's really choppy and so I just wanted to let people know we'll have a cleaner copy um after and we're really sorry about that. Just wanted to okay. add that so people can't hear. Uh, I did want to add one more thing. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um I no that's okay. I just I just want to say um to everyone who is watching, even though it's choppy. We need to do this together. And please um, encourage um, your children to wear masks at school. I'm getting students emailing us saying that um, that's a problem. And um, just for the safety feeling, if for no other reason, of other students. Um, and I'm, I'm not, judging or saying that any parent is not doing this, but just as a, no matter how good of parents we are, our children sometimes do things we don't want them to do. So let's just keep, you know, reminding our, our um, students that we want to make sure everybody's safe. All right, thank you. Uh, Director Bristol. Good morning. Uh, Corey, thank you. I know it's been a rough week for you. I've been watching this and you've been very uh, supportive and helpful in giving us information all along. Um, I know that uh, for many parents on the line today, it may be a surprise that we're doing uh, this uh, new approach where we're, we have the activities continuing. Uh, and uh, so I don't know if they're aware of the fact that you got some additional guidance that's allowing that to continue. Um, so if you could maybe help them understand how we're doing that and how that's going to impact not only maybe activities that happen out on the, on the football field, but other activities that might be happening indoors. Uh, I think that would be clarifying for everybody that's watching. Yeah, thank you, Director Bristol. And, and uh, we did receive new guidance um, this week. You know, at the end of last week, the guidance was a bit different. And um, I think with some things that have happened around the state, um, we got new guidance Tuesday night, very late Tuesday night, that uh, districts can continue to offer athletics and activities as long as we're not seeing those large-scale outbreaks or high-level impacts on, you know, teams or individual schools. Um, so as long as we've been, we've been able to avoid that, we're going to be able to continue offering our athletics and really kind of making those decisions at a local level. So I'm hopeful that, you know, if we can continue to follow those um, safety plans, that should my, in my hope, uh, allow the fall season to com be completed and move into that winter sports and activity season um, safely and continue to move in that direction. So we were basically given that permission uh, this week. Thank you. So, you know, I think that it's important for, you know, all the people that have been writing us to know that we're doing everything we can to, to allow as much of a normal experience as possible in these abnormal times. And because we, we, we all know that uh, these are defining times for our, our students and uh, we, want, we want them to have the most out of it that they can get, you know, because none of us want to see them have to go home. None of us want to see them isolated. None of us want to see any of those things. And, uh, you know, we, we're uh, constantly looking for a way to, to do these things better and differently. And so I thank you and the rest of the administration for that. One other question I have, you know, when we look at the readiness indicators and you, you mentioned that the child care is still yellow, uh, what, if any, impact of this move is there on child care? I'm thinking these are not students that are impacting child care. So um, is it just the continuous ongoing issue or is there something else? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. It's a continuous ongoing challenge we've had um, really with any model uh, right now that we're dealing with that child care continues to be a a challenge, but because the model does involve, you know, the elementary level, we keep that on there just so we can continue to uh, track our metrics around that um, as far as making sure we can staff that uh, offering as, as well as we can. So, yep, it's a carryover from some of the other models we've been working on. Okay. 
Well, to all of you that have been writing on all sides of the issue, just know that we care. We're listening. If we can't get back to you and right away because there's such a huge volume of it, don't know know that every one of them is getting read, and it's it's very impactful on all of us on the board. We we really um, we know what is going on, and uh, you know we 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 really appreciate the time you're taking to write, the detail that you're giving, the thought that you're putting into your positions, and uh, it's all going into the decisions that we're making today. So thank you. Mike, I think you're muted there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, thank you uh, Court <laughs> and uh, Director Simons. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, to say this is a difficult decision is certainly an understatement. Um, the majority of the work that we do is really being able to select from multiple good options to best deliver on our mission and serve our students. And certainly none of us expected to be in a position where we're making a decision that many families have expressed in either case will have a harmful effect either to their students' safety or their academic or overall well-being. So in this case, I find myself that I simply have to be direct um, and transparent. So um, I really do believe maximizing uh, in-person instruction, I think we've all said this, is best for our students. And I do believe that our health and safety measures create a safe environment for our scholars, even when the community case numbers are climbing. Um, but we also made a promise to our families as to how decisions would be made. And that's why we set our decision model forward. Um, we were clear in that criteria, um, and at the time, the state set those parameters around cases per 10,000, um, indicated we could not be less restrictive. Um, and even though, though that's changed just in a matter of a few days um, to enable us to consider local data or other factors in that decision model, we, we did set a model and we made a promise to our families that that's the model that we would be using, um, and that was their understanding when selecting the option to go into the distance learning academy or to stay in, in this situation where we knew we could be moving. So I believe we really need to hold to that promise to our families. Um, however, with that, um, I do think that we need to re update our decision model um, in advance of the second trimester now that there's new parameters. So I think that should be an immediate priority for our work session to review our decision model and begin to factor in that flexibility that's now been um, clarified to us um, so that we can again be very clear on what the decision model will be and enable our families to make the right decision that's best for their child as we move into the upcoming second trimester. Um, so, and, and again, I'd like to echo that we, we've we received so many emails um, and we read, we do read everyone and they're, they're extremely impactful. Um, that there's two that in my mind that stick out to me, which is um, when, when parents are writing, screenshotting their kids' grades, um, talking to us about how they've seen negative impact. That's, that's really impactful when we hear that. We, we don't want our students to be declining in academic or mental health. And, and that's, that's, we hear you and we don't want that for any of our students. Um, and we also hear from families who are frustrated that if we make a decision to remain in hybrid, that we're jeopardizing the safety of their student and their family and they'll remove their child from our system. So this is, we hear all of that um, and the, it, there are no easy answers and we respect um, all of those um, perspectives and feedback. So please know that we do hear you. Um, so I, I hope that we can continue to move forward. We can build the parameters and reestablish that commitment to our families on how we'll use um, that flexibility going forward so that we can um, have our families making the best choice for their students going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Director Simons. Um, Superintendent McIntyre, yesterday uh, you shared with me the number of actual transmission cases that we've had in the schools. Could you share that with everybody, please? The number yeah. of, of transmission cases connected, traced to the schools. Yeah, we have not had we have not had any confirmation of actual transmission in the in the buildings, which is a testament to our safe learning plan efforts and COVID plans. With I would so add, in, to that, yeah, if I could, I I would add to that. Um, that that's been a good. That's what we want, right? That's exactly what we're hoping for. Uh, with the increasing positive so, cases um, and symptomatic cases and close contact, I'm concerned that that could change. And I'm hearing from uh, colleagues around the metro that that is happening. So we're trying to minimize the likelihood of transmissions happening, but our risk factors go up the more cases we see in our buildings. 
Right. And these transmissions that are occurring amongst students, they're occurring in the community. We've had uh, at an average rate of around 40 uh, per 14 days per 10,000, which is about 600. And I know it's gone up lately. So we've had six to 800 cases at least in the last two weeks across our district, but not one of them was traced to the school. So the school is a safe place uh, where it is distancing, where it is clean, where we are taking those precautions, whereas the community uh, is a less safe place where transmission is occurring. So what we're saying, we want to take our students and put them out into the community and not into a, and not keep them in the classrooms, which are arguably a much safer place based upon the numbers you just shared, correct? I'm not sure I totally agree with you there. Um, our guidance from our experts have been um, to the fact that we're going to see increases positive increased positive cases, increased symptomatic cases, and increased close contact cases, meaning increased quarantining, our risk of transmission will increase, is my opinion. But again, that's just based on what I'm hearing from our consultation calls. And I get that um, not everyone's in agreement with the metrics and the data, and that's the challenge of this whole thing, right? Uh, that I'm is the looking at the safety of the schools, and our numbers are actually two weeks fresher than what the numbers we're getting from uh, MDE, MDH, and they're saying they're going to go up. So the numbers we just got from our own students in our own classrooms would be the latest, would be, you know, fresher than anything else. And again, even these, even though the numbers are expected to rise, we still have not had transmission in the schools that, that we know of. That we know of. Okay. Uh, and we're tracing and the state's tracing and we're tracing and we're doing all of this work. Uh, you know, based upon what the uh, regulations are, and it looks like they've worked, where we've kept transmission out of the schools and our kids safe in the schools. But in the community, that's a different story. That's correct. Up to this point, again, I, my concern is that is going to change, and I've heard that changing in, in other districts around us. So um, we've been fortunate up to this point, and that's a testament to our teachers and, and our families to do what we are asking them to do. Um, but as the uh, projection looks, uh, our risk factors for transmission will increase. Uh, community transmission has been increasing, absolutely. Transmission in our schools is zero. Uh, okay. Uh, with that, Can any, I ask, uh, sorry. Any, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, any other questions? Yes, uh, I have a question. Any other questions? I have a question. Okay. Superintendent McIntyre, um, just one clarification about distance learning plus so you know seniors and juniors are you know you know college or you know the next kind of phase is kind of on the horizon so with distance learning plus have you considered or will there ever be an option for let's say seniors to go meet with like an advisor or go to the career resource center or anything um during the this period that if we potentially move to distance learning at this point, I think that can still be done virtually. So right now we're starting with uh, the students where we know we need to provide um, the most intensive services, but we will definitely keep that in mind as we move forward and see if that's a possibility and we, we can do it safely. But some of those services we can provide virtually as well. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, uh, Jackie? Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, my first question is, um, I've been hearing from families that they are not able to get in to the distance learning academy. And so um, what kind of what's the waiting list? Um, what is that looking like for families that are concerned about the rising numbers? Um, and, you know, like what are the options? That's my first question. If I'll let you take that one first. Yeah, so thank you. We're in uh, consultation right now awaiting uh, a decision from the Minnesota Department of Education around our proposal to uh, have a process for uh, anyone who wants to enroll for DLA at the trimester break so that we have ample time to plan for staffing to ensure those class sizes stay manageable and uh, any adjustments with transportation and so forth like that. So uh, we're hopeful to have a final approval for that process here really any day uh, from the Department of Education. And then as soon as we have that, we will be communicating that out. 
uh, to our families. Do we have any idea of how many people are on that waiting list? Are we talking like tens or hundreds or? We have not had approval from MDE to actually have a waiting list, but we are trying to informally track that through our enrollment center based on the calls and requests we mm -hmm. get. So, um, we, and I think what we might see with this, you know, every model kind of has a, a um, result there and an impact. So we may see maybe fewer requests from secondary now if we're in distance learning, and we may see in, maybe some increases at the elementary level if, if um, you know, with this new model. So um, it's hard to pro project that, but we know people are interested. And so we're, again, continuing to wait for that green light from the Department of Ed to uh, move forward with our, our proposal to how we can do it um, effectively. And then my last question is, um, I know the biggest concern about going to distance learning is um, academic and emotional well-being. So I just want to reiterate that if we need to um, have any more resources to um, do any more creative ways of making sure that our students' social emotional needs are met um, when we have to do what we have to do to make sure everyone's um, safe that um, I'm, you know, I'm on board for that. And then um, just a um, encouragement for us to um, continue because I know we're working hard at it and we've gotten some new contracts to make sure we have more mental health um, professionals, but to continue um, addressing those needs. Sorry, Mike, you're muted still. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, so um, with the distance learning plus, um, again, reiterating on the special education and additional supports, as quickly as we can get that clarity out for families, um, please let's uh, get that out because I know that's really been a high volume topic as well to ensure that um, we're being as uh, mindful as we can and offering as much as we can to that particular group that has a higher need. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Director Simons. And uh, depending on the decision this morning, um, we will uh, move in partnership with our uh, Education Minnesota OSIO uh, leaders on how to do that um, effectively and how we set that uh, model up uh, to work for our students. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Sherry, can you please uh, call the vote? Director Bristol? Aye. Director Dawson Walton? Aye. Director Simons? Aye. Director Ostafi? Nay. Director Mosqueda Jones? Aye. Director Douglas? Aye. The motion passes five to one. All right. Thank you. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I moved. Second. Okay. Second. Uh, Sherry, can you call the uh, can you call the vote? Director Ostafi. All right. Director Douglas. Aye. Director Mosqueda Jones. Aye. Director Dawson Walton. Aye. Director Simons. Aye. Aye. Director Bristol? Aye. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. And again, this was to go to distance on November 9th for secondary. So thank you, everybody. Have a uh, good day.